Dear friends and family in Christ, may you know the rich grace of God, our Heavenly Father, and the promise and the reassurance that through your baptism you are his very own. Amen. Please pray with me. Almighty God and merciful Father, we give thanks to you for each day that you give us to be your people on this earth. We thank you that through our baptism you have taken us sinners and made us your saints. We pray that every day we would live as those your people, sharing your love in the world, proclaiming the good news, standing up for you, so that all may know the promise of your salvation. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You know, in the world we live in today, there's quite a bit of persecution. There's a lot of persecution, not only of Christians, but of all sorts of different faiths, ethnicities, nationalities. But so often as we are Christian, we hear and we pick up on those persecutions of Christians. How many of us can go a day without hearing in the news, assuming we turn on the news or read in the paper, about another Islamic State massacre or some other kind of harm done to Christians? How many of us know that it's illegal in China to be a Christian? How many of us here in the United States, maybe never experiencing physical persecution, but have certainly witnessed and experienced persecution for our faith. We're not allowed to share it with others. It's okay to have faith, but not to share it with others, your co-workers, or that might be intolerant. We certainly talk about persecution. We seem to know about persecution, but we don't completely understand the persecution of the early church. We don't completely understand how significant it was that in 313, Constantine signed that Edict of Milan. Now in the past, we've talked a little bit about that persecution. In the, in the, because, of the, because of the Roman Empire, Christians were persecuted for their unwillingness to bow down to the emperor, unwillingness to bow down to the pantheon, the, the multitude of gods in the Roman system. Sometimes the persecution was quite severe quite rigorous. Some emperors, like one Galenius, he was not nearly as rigorous in his persecution. For 40 years, in fact, Christianity was able to at least exist, be tolerated. But there was an emperor of Rome by the name of Diocletian. He was emperor from 284 to 305 AD. And this emperor Diocletian has been known by Christians because during his time was what was called the Great Persecution. It didn't start out that way. When Diocletian became the emperor, he started out slowly. He removed Christians from military service. He stopped allowing Christians to have a voice in the government and removed advisors and replaced them with anti-Christian advisors. But in 303 A.D., he received an oracle from the temple of, to Apollo. Now, I don't know if you know your Roman mythology, but Roman mythology teaches that Apollo was one of the Roman gods. Who, he was the god of music and the poetry. It, most importantly, he was the god of wisdom. People would seek this god of Apollo to try to gain insight into the future, wisdom and knowledge. Well, in 303, February, in fact, Diocletian received an oracle that encouraged him to begin what was now called the Great Persecution. He signed an edict, and right away, he immediately started making it illegal to hold Christian scriptures. If you had a copy of the book of Matthew, you must turn that over to Roman soldiers so that it might be burned. If you were a, Roman, or if you were a Christian clergyman, you had to step down, even deny your faith if you wanted to live. If you attended a Christian church, your church was destroyed, right after they looted it for all the good. And this was just the beginning of the persecution. In fact, he signed five, uh, four more, to a total of five edicts, persecuting Christians, Christians being martyred in the streets in ways that I won't describe here. You can read it in the history books, but it is awful. It is ways that we would not want to talk about or think about. It reminds us of what's going on under the Islamic State. Diocletian's persecution didn't end until 
about 311 A.D. when one of his successors, Galerius, signed a reasonable treaty of peace with Christians, an edict allowing them to at least live. In 313 A.D. was when the Edict of Milan was signed by Constantine. And this changed everything. All of a sudden, Christians were allowed to have their faith. All of a sudden, Christians were allowed to live as the people of God. But before that, before that, if they wanted to worship their God, they had to do so in secrecy. Not all of Christians responded the same way, though, to the persecution. Some Christians were actually what we would today call fanatics. There was a bishop of Carthage by the name of Mencerius. And Mencerius wrote to the bishop of Numidia. Both of these are uh, in northern Africa. And, and he described how some Christian clergymen were bragging and boasting about the fact that they did not turn over their scriptures. They were going out in the street and holding them up that they might get martyred. He wrote that those men should not be honored because they were not boasting in the Lord, but boasting in themselves. In fact, if you follow that letter a little further from Mencerius to the Bishop of Numidia, you discover that it was not just Christian priests who were doing this, but there were criminals, enemies of the state who were doing this, who had heard that in prison Christians were friendly to other Christians. So there were people who were non-Christian saying that so that they would have good treatment by their fellow prisoners. Well, that's one response. On the other end, you had the response of what have now been called the tratadores. It comes from a Latin word, tratador, which is the same root as our word for traitor, treason. And on an interesting note, tradition. Uh, because it literally means the one or the ones who hand things over. Uh, you can see where tradition, the one who hands things down to the next generation. But these tratadores, they, not only did they not hold on to their scriptures, but when the Roman guard came knocking, they immediately turned them over. When their lives were put on the line, they denied their faith. They did not stand up for their faith when they were going to be put to death, when their families were going to be put to death. Now, before you judge them, take a second to think about the situation they were in. I'm not saying or defending their cowardice in any way. But at least think about the situation that they were in. They certainly did not stand for their faith at that time. All this changed, though, in that 313. Because suddenly it was legal again to be a Christian. A lot of these tratadores, they returned to their positions that they were in before, whether it be priests or even bishops. They returned to their positions. Most of the church forgave them. Most of the church accepted their, their repentance. Some of, the, some of the church required that they again repeat their ordination vows, but most of the church was willing to forgive them. But not all of the church. There was a bishop in Carthage following Mencerius by the name of Donatus. In fact, it was Donatus Magnus. We don't know much about his early life. We just know that he had grown up around Carthage, northern Africa there, during the, the time of Diocletian's persecutions. And Donatus and Donatus and the Donatists, they did not accept the apology of these tratadores. They did not accept their apology, nor did they forgive them. In fact, Donatus went so far as to teach that if a bishop who had been a tratadore, if he returned to his position, that if he distributed the sacrament, it was no longer efficacious. In other words, it did not provide forgiveness of sins. So let's say that we had a tratadore, according to Donatus, standing in front of you, and he offered, said the words of institution, distributed the Lord's Supper to you. You would not receive the body and blood of Christ, nor the forgiveness of sins. This was the teaching of Donatus. If, you, if one of these tratadores baptized a child, that child would still have the old Adam, the old Eve living within them. And that was the teaching of Donatus. 
And many actually bought into Donatus' teaching. Before we condemn him, what he was teaching was a desire to keep the church pure. He wasn't forbidding these folks from returning to being members of the church, but he could not have them as leaders of the church anymore. He could not believe that they could again stand in the position of authority, preaching to the people of God, teaching the people of God, distributing the sacraments to them. Many followed him, and it created a great schism in the church. Not the great schism, that's quite a few years from then, but it created a schism, a separation. And this is truly why he is called a heretic, is because he created this division in the church. It was in 409 A.D. that he was finally declared a heretic. Those who followed him were required to turn over their churches, were not allowed to continue preaching. The problem wasn't necessarily with where Donatus began. It was where his teaching led. It was where he went from there. Because as he taught the, the, this idea that he only wanted saints preaching from the pulpits and no sinners allowed, he expected this level of perfection. Much like Pelagius, he desired then that the Christian community at large, not only the priests, but all Christians live a perfect life. There should, was no room for sinners among the saints. Truly, that is where most heresies begin, don't they? From a small passage of Scripture. From a small part of God's Word. Blown out of context. Blown out of proportion. Well, Donatus' teaching has those two problems. First of all, it calls the sacraments into question. But secondly, it causes the community of Christians, the believers, to question their own walk with God whether or not they can call themselves the people of God. In other words, what is the standard of perfection by which we me measure whether or not a person is good enough to be called a Christian? And if we're honest with ourselves, well, we certainly label this heresy Donatism. How many of us have also maybe struggled with this same question? We had a reading from Jesus' own words today in Matthew chapter 5. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Are any of you perfect? Or then the reading from 1 Peter where he quotes the words of Leviticus. You shall be holy for I am holy, says the Lord. When you take an honest look at your heart and your life, are you perfect? Are you holy? Is any pastor or priest, bishop or pope or synod president who stands before you, are they holy and perfect? There is only one. But we certainly wrestle with this in our own walk with God, don't we? We wrestle with what it means to live as saints and sinners. In fact, there are other texts of God's Word that confront us in a very uncomfortable way. In Hebrews chapter 6, the author of Hebrews, he reminds us about repentance. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding them up and holding him up to contempt. Now, just in case you didn't follow that whole text, what the author of Hebrews was saying there those who have once received the glories of God, who have been forgiven, who have been washed and made clean, well, if they've been forgiven, then they will not fall away. In fact, it is impossible for them to be restored according to the author of Hebrews. And we read texts like that, or texts like the Matthew 5 or 1 Peter, and it makes us look at our own faith. It makes us, even among us as Lutherans, question, am I good enough? Am I perfect enough? Am I holy enough? At what point 
will God continue to forgive me a poor, miserable sinner? And that's the law doing its work. That's the law of God doing its work on our hearts and lives because that is what the law does. The law shows us that we are sinful people, that we cannot ever meet this impossibly high standard. The law shows us that of our own, that of who we are, that we could never even hope to approach God, that we are poor, miserable sinners. We are utter failures. And that is the law doing its work in our lives. The law's job is to condemn us. It is not ours to wield as we will. It's not ours to dole out in judgment of others, thinking that we know better for them, that we know their heart. Sadly, I've heard where some preachers, and I must confess that I, if I've done this, then I seek your forgiveness. But some preachers will use the law as a car- like a carrot in front of a horse. The carrot's hanging out there just a little bit further. The horse never reaches it, though, always trotting along, hoping just he can smell it, but he can't ever eat it. And some preachers will use the law this way. They'll talk about the law as if it's, if you reach this, this is the ideal. Then you have arrived. And it's always just right there beyond your grasp. No matter how hard you try, no matter how perfect your life is, no matter how often you live according to God's word, It's just out of your grasp a little further and you could. You still can't reach it. Because the law is not ours to wield. It is God's law. When we wield it and take it into our own hands, passing judgment, trying to use it against others, we are breaking the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. For we are usurping God's authority. The law does its job when we are hopeless because then we see the beauty of God's grace. Because then we see the richness of God's mercy and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. When the law does its job, we realize that we had no hope, but now we do have hope because we are the children of God. We are those who have been washed and made clean. We are those for whom He has made holy and set apart. When we use that word sanctified in church, it is not an action on our part. We do not make ourselves holy. It is purely, purely the work of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says it so well. He's writing this letter to the church in Thessalonica. He's encouraging these Christian believers. And he says it so well just as he's about to wrap up the letter. Listen to his words. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ he who calls you is faithful he will surely do it he starts it out as if it's a condition and then he nails it at the end he will surely do it and he has surely done it because that is what we believe when jesus died on the cross when he poured out his blood on the cross he did so for you to wash you and make you clean. He did so so that when you were baptized, when the water was poured over your head, you were made a child of God. Because that is the power of God's Word. That is the power of God's forgiveness, His grace, and His mercy. And that is why when you receive the sacrament, when you receive the gift of God's baptism, That is what it is. It is a pure gift. It is a gift from Him. Listen to to Peter's words in 1 Peter chapter 3. Baptism now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to Him. Baptism now saves you. It is not the pastor. It is not the priest. It is the Word of God coming together with that water. It is the promise of God that He will forgive you through baptisms. 
when you receive the Holy Supper, when you receive the Lord's Supper, it is not the priest or the pastor. It is not. No one would be perfect enough to distribute it. No one would be worthy to give it to you. It is the promise of Jesus Christ. Listen to his words as Matthew records them in Matthew 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. For the forgiveness of sins. It is the word of God, the promise of God coming together with the body and blood, with the bread and wine, that we might receive the bread and wine as the body and blood of Christ, the forgiveness of our sins. It is that forgiveness. It's not who's doing it. Because truly we are unworthy. Pastors are unworthy. Maybe you've wondered at times, why do pastors wear all the extra vestments? You see pastors who will wear suits and maybe just polo shirts, things like that. And and that's fine because they can proclaim the gospel. But why do we in in the Lutheran church, why do I put on these robes every Sunday? It's not just because I like to be extra warm and it's cold in church. It's because it's a reminder that we are clothed in Christ's righteousness and that I am a sinful man underneath. I'm wearing black and my soul is black except for Jesus Christ's forgiveness. And so we are clothed in Christ's righteousness, that beautiful image of the white robe, white robe given to us in baptism. Thanks be to God, the burden is not on us. But he has borne the burden himself. If we were to follow Donatus' teaching, think about this for just a moment. What happens if in the middle of the words of institution, all of a sudden I started thinking about that next week the Jets are going to beat the Bills and last week they beat the Steelers. And if according to Donatus, then the words of institution would not be valid. They would not be efficacious. Christ's body and blood would not be present. By the way, I don't ever think about football in church unless it's as an illustration. I encourage you to do the same to focus, but my point here is that God's Word and the bread and wine are what make the sacrament efficacious. It's what makes it forgive your sins. It is not the person doing it. It is not even the worthiness of us because which of us could truly be worthy? Now, one time we're going to have to talk about right reception But know this, it is a free gift. Sacraments are those free gifts of God. And this is very important for us today. It was very important throughout the history of the church. Because during the history of the church, there was a time when this very question came up. Are the sacraments efficacious? It was at the time of the Reformation when Martin Luther and other Catholic priests left the Catholic Church. There was a question, a big question mark that was asked. Are the sacraments still efficacious? Because according to the Roman church, they were no longer part of the true church. And this is still official doctrine of the Catholic church today, is that the Roman Catholic church is God's true church on earth. This was a huge question for not only the priests like Martin Luther, but it was a question for all of those who were present. All the laity who followed them Are we receiving the forgiveness of sins? Luther and the other reformers went back to this Donatist controversy. And they read the words of St. Augustine. Augustine has been hugely influential in all of the Christian church. And they saw this debate that went on a couple thousand, well, about 1,200 years before. And they saw that the promise came because of this God's, or that the, the sacraments were efficacious because of God's promise. In fact, they had a term that they used to refer to this. It's a Latin phrase, ex opera operato. And it literally means that the works work. 
the works work. Because it is the sacrament itself that provides, through the grace of God, forgiveness of sins. Now, as we have gone through these various heresies, I remind you that most of the heretics we've talked about, they did not start out with an intent to destroy the church. Donatus, his desire was to purify the church, not destroy it. But it's when they got away from the word of God, when they allowed human philosophies and human reasoning to cloud the truth of God's word. And so as we close up this series, I want to remind you to always, always be in God's word. Because that is where the truth is. Not in a single verse here and a single verse there, but the whole breadth of God's word speaks to us the truth of salvation. And it gives us the most important truth of all. The truth that Jesus Christ is our salvation. He alone is our salvation. And because of Him, we have hope that one day, as He has risen, we too shall arise. And we're just about to the season of Advent, so we're going to have to put away our hallelujahs. But maybe you remember from Easter, hallelujah, Christ our Lord is risen. He is risen indeed, hallelujah, and we too shall arise, amen. Please pray with me. Almighty God and merciful Father, we thank you for the salvation that we have, that you have so richly poured out upon each of us because of your Son, Christ Jesus. Help us each day to know that as he has died, he has paid the entire price for our sins. Because he lives, because he has risen, we too shall arise. Help us to live each day knowing that we have been forgiven, that we are your saints. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.